Secretary Ross, thank you for joining us today. I'm glad to be on with you. And so Vice President Pence here at the Space Symposium unveiled a new space traffic management policy. You're going to be ta taking the helm on that. What are the details? Well, the details are the following. Space already has some 4,500 satellites careening around up there and tens of thousands of objects, some of them quite large, some under 10 centimeters in size. But they all pose a threat to the existing satellites because the satellites are powered by solar panels and an object moving at 4.7 miles per second can do tremendous amount of damage to the panel. So space situational awareness and space traffic management are becoming very, very important as more and more satellites come up. You can see from this exhibit, there's a lot more to go. Why does it make sense for the Commerce Department to be regulating this and looking at this issue? Well, the decision has been made by the Space Council, approved by the Chairman, Vice President Pence, and hopefully by the President, that we want to centralize things, make it a one-stop shopping. So Commerce already has the licensing of remote sensing devices. Commerce already has a lot of activities to do with the spectrum. Commerce has a lot to do with setting standards and technology. So the idea was to try to make a one-stop shop. And space traffic management is going to become increasingly important in that. And between that, between the fact that you're looking to cut regulatory red tape uh, when it comes to space operations, I mean, it really seems to me that it speaks to the dramatic growth we're seeing in this sort of new space race, the, the growth of the commercial sector. How are you looking to work with these companies that are coming onto the scene and looking to innovate space? Sure. Well, the space is already a $339 billion business, and we think it won't be very long before it's a trillion dollar business. So those are getting to be big, big numbers. But we're not alone in the competition. There are 70 countries and over 1,500 individual entities doing something with space. So we're trying to make sure that the U.S. maintains its leadership and that we are the flag of choice for space launches. When you say a trillion dollar business, I mean, that's comparable with sort of trade flows we see on Earth. Right. Uh, what are you envisioning? Well, a lot is going to happen. The first thing is within the next year, you're going to have space tourism. People are literally paying $250,000 for a ride into suborbital space. And Richard Branson has already signed up, I think it's 60 customers for that activity with a lot more to come because these are people who prepaid for a rocket that doesn't even quite exist yet. Second and more importantly, you'll have lunar landings. You'll have the moon will ultimately become a sort of gas station for space flights en route to Mars. For a lot of technical reasons, it'll use a lot less fuel to make it a stop in the moon and then on to Mars. And the moon is a perfect place for a gas station because it has huge amounts of ice. Those dark spikes that you see in the moon are really solid ice. Well, what is ice? It's hydrogen and oxygen. That's what you need for rocket fuel. So they will relaunch the spacecraft from the moon to Mars. It'll save a huge amount of money, greatly increase the payload, and that in turn will lead to putting colonies on Mars, it will lead to space mining. The asteroids are very rich in all kinds of natural resources, so that's another whole activity. Further, there will be activity in space manufacturing. There's already a company that's about to come out with a new kind of fiber optic that's 30% more effective than existing ones, and it was created in outer space because in outer space, materials take on different properties, and therefore the end result is quite changed. When you speak about lunar landings and refueling stations on the moon and then going to Mars and beyond, right. what is the timeline you envision for this? Well, space tourism within the next year or so. Moon landing, probably a couple years, but meanwhile there's a tremendous amount of activity. There are a lot of launches, a lot of preparatory work that needs to be done, all of which leads to revenues for the space providers. 
when you talk about asteroid mining, right. high risk but also potentially high reward, um, it sounds to me like there's potential here to be negotiating trade in outer space uh, and sort of revisions to some of the treaties we've seen in the past. I mean, how do you dis well, have those discussions with countries? And Well, we need to have it on an international basis because we're really talking an intergalactic uh, environment in which they're operating. So somebody has to try to figure out what are the rules of the road. If you get to the asteroid first, are all the minerals there yours, or is it just what you dig out the first time? All kinds of complicated questions come in. So also, when you get into space tourism and space colonization with humans, there are all kinds of safety factors, all kinds of economic factors, all kinds of medical factors to deal with. So it's very, very complex but very, very essential. Are you already mapping out those rules of the road? Well, we're thinking about them. Since this is just newly given to us, we obviously don't have it all worked out yet. And I want to get your thoughts on trade, because we're here at the Space Symposium. Right. Um, China's obviously been a big focus with the tit-for-tat tariff discussions going back and forth and sort of elevated tensions there. But China has also been building out its own space capabilities. And it's also been building out its military might in the Asia Pacific. So I wanted to sort of get your thoughts, um, especially when you talk about things like intellectual property theft. I mean, aerospace and defense has been sort of a key sector that's experienced that. When you talk about something like trade tensions with China and this notion of tariffs, how much of it is reducing the trade deficit, opening up that country to U.S. companies, and how much of it is the fact that whether it's in space or on Earth, China is becoming a bigger security threat? Well, there are about 10,000 questions in that <laughs> question, <laughs> so I'll try to answer what I can. Um, we don't mind competing with China in any sphere, as long as the rules are fair, as long as it's a level playing field. It's not right when they force joint ventures of American companies with local ones just in order to manufacture. And it's not right when they then force the transfer of intellectual property. It's even farther from being right if they do cyber attacks and, and steal intellectual property. So all we're really trying to do is levelize the playing field and then we're happy to compete. I know we're here to talk about space, but I also just want to get your thoughts on TPP, given the fact that President Trump has signaled uh, interest in renegotiating that. What would make TPP fair to the U.S. and something you'd consider re-entering? Well, remember, when President Trump withdrew from it shortly after he came into office, he made it clear it wasn't that he was opposed to a deal with those countries. He's very interested in the Asia-Pacific sector. What he didn't like was the specific terms of it. So as he has made clear again in his very recent tweet, it's all a function of the terms. If we can get satisfactory terms, just as he has said before, he's happy to go back in, but not if the terms aren't satisfactory. One last question for you. Are we close to a deal on NAFTA? Well, we're closer than we used to be, but you don't have a deal on anything until you have a deal on everything. Great. Anything else uh, regarding space that we haven't talked about that you want to highlight? Well, I think one of the big derivatives from the new space effort could be the same thing that happened when Jack Kennedy did the first moon race. And that is getting students interested again in science, technology, engineering, and math. We need that for the technology we need that for the future growth of the country, but it's fallen to the wayside. Kids are not really taking those subjects anymore. I think a renovated space effort is liable to result in much more interest in those sectors, and that's a very, very good thing for the future of our country. Do you think something like the SpaceX Falcon Heavy launch stirs that interest? Oh, oh I think it did. Now, it's, it's, it's a little PR-ish to have the red convertible hurtling out there toward Mars, but it made a point, and it made it very real, and it showed that this isn't just some arcane thing. Launching a car out there is a very good dramatic effect. Personally, I was more impressed by the fact that two booster rockets were able to disengage, 
fall, come right back down to earth pretty much on the exact spot they were supposed to and be reusable. Those uh, launch systems had already been used once. This is the second time. We saw them after they had come back. They're reusable again. So that's a very good thing because that's going to change the economics of space because that's a hugely expensive part of the whole activity. Great. Secretary Ross, thank you. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.